We have to make the choice every single day to channel our own inner Jucindas. To exemplify the truth and the respect and the grace that we actually wish for the world. We need to tell it as we're doing at this conference. We need to write it. We need to sing it. We need to proclaim it. We need to be it. We need to be the truth. We have to be the respect. We have to be the fierceness, the love that we want to see. And when we do that, mark my words, a change is already coming. I teach them that there is no life without cultivating a spiritual life because you are first and foremost a spiritual being having a human experience. And if you lose sight of that, it's easy to get lost in the world and no one can save a world that they're lost in when they've lost sight of their own North Star. So having a spiritual life actually means actively and ritually creating the space in your life all the time for gratitude, for kindness, for empathy, for inspiration, for joy, and for reverence for life in the home of your soul first. And then working to spread that inner joy outward. It means slowing down. It means taking in the moment. It means being exactly where you are, not distracted somewhere else. It means knowing who you are and getting about the business of fulfilling why you really came to our planet. It is your job to make yourself whole. Not perfect, but whole and full. Your real work in life, your real work, is to fill yourself till your cup runneth over so that you're never grasping and needy, clamoring and insecure but if you can live your life assured in your worthiness and your right to be here and to become the best version of yourself as a woman being. I want to propose that you resolve something very powerful, to love who you are right now. And of course I think that wanting to be your best self and setting goals and intentions is really major. But I remember during a stop on the 2020 Vision Tour, I met this reporter in Miami we took some photos together and she said to me, Oprah, next time you see me, I'm gonna be so much skinnier. And I replied, well, the next time I see you, hopefully you're gonna be as healthy as you can be in that moment. Because right now, this is as healthy as you can be in this moment. And the next time you'll be as healthy as you can be in that moment. I told her to be kind to herself. And she looked at me and said, how do I do that? Well, it starts with, loving right now who you are, all yourself, your flaws, living in a space of lack focused on what you don't want or what you don't like about yourself, I, I promise you I've learned it doesn't work. Take a moment to look at what is really running through your mind about yourself that may be holding you back. The energy of the universe responds to positivity. And so if you're telling yourself you're not slim enough, you're not good enough, when that negative chatter starts in your head, stops, Lean away from it. When you let those thoughts of not being enough seep in, you can't really act out the best of yourself. So your actions must be in alignment with all the goodness and strengths that you know to be true about yourself. So this week, I'm inviting you to put on your happy sweater, wherever it is or whatever that is for you, quiet all the negative self-talk and allow your confidence, your sense of knowing that better days are ahead to be at the forefront of your thinking. Tomorrow's never promise. So let's accept and then let's celebrate ourselves just where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you for where I am and who I am right now. Let that be the blessing and intention for ourselves this week. Letting go of energy that's clouding your vision and holding you back. It's a life practice that I learned long ago that has freed me whew, so many ways. It's a fact that holding grudges against somebody who's done you wrong or replaying, revisiting hurtful situations in your head over and over only weighs you down and prevents you from being 
who you're meant to be right now because you're still energetically holding on to the past. The energy that you put into constantly rewinding to the resentment, why did they do that? Why did they say that to me? I didn't deserve to be treated that way. All of that only keeps you stuck. It will never change what happened. You've got to press stop and reject the urge to keep replaying so that you can then fast forward into the now for yourself. You know, a lot of people think that holding on to things that disempowered them is going to somehow magically turn it around. Mm -mm. As I said in my message a couple of weeks ago about forgiveness, you have to release the notion, give up the hope that the past could have been any different. And you also must release the idea that people would do what you might do in any given instance. This is a big one. I had to learn and relearn before I actually got it. Expecting people to do what you would do in a situation only leads to your disappointment. Not theirs, they're going on with their life. So let people be who they are and either you accept it or you don't. Not doing that keeps you stuck in a circumstance that actually costs you time, costs you energy. And I can guarantee that oftentimes the person on the other side of the bitterness you're holding on to, they're not even thinking about you. In fact, they probably have just moved on. They certainly aren't obsessing the way you are. Think of it like letting go of any bad habit that just doesn't serve your well-being. Not an easy task. Taking the road to a more enlightened, healthy existence never is. So this is what I want to ask you to ask yourself. Why am I holding on to this? How is this serving me? And really think about the answer. Maybe it makes you feel validated. Maybe it makes you feel righteous. Or maybe taking on the pain is your way of recognizing the injustice so that even though it won't be made right, it can at least not be forgotten. Then I ask you, again, ask yourself, do you want to be right or do you want peace? Woo, this was huge for me. The unfortunate fact is that having both may not be possible. And also, you may never get your moment of righteousness, so why wait for it? Choose peace. What I know for sure is that in this world, time is a moving on, and it's our most valuable commodity. You can never get it back. So staying in that loop, playing it over and over in your head of hurt, only amplifies your pain. Let it go. Exhale, make room in your heart for something that is uplifting. Surround yourself with people who want the best for you. You have the ability to shift the DNA of your spirit and control how you perceive life. So why not lighten your load and let it go? Living integrity means living in a way that honors your truest self. It's doing the thing that you know you're supposed to do. My friend Martha Beck says that deep down, we all know what makes us happy and how to create your best possible life. And that knowledge is actually coded into your very nature. But I also know how challenging it can be to listen and trust your own inner voice, especially when you feel the pressures of what everybody else thinks you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to stay married. You're supposed to have a baby. You're supposed to have a picture-perfect home. But here's something that I'm hoping you all will realize for yourself. Sometimes it takes doing the things that people or society say you're not supposed to be doing to find out what is true for you. What is, what are you really supposed to be doing? For example, at the very beginning of my career, some of you heard this story, I worked as a news anchor and reporter in Baltimore. It taught me a lot about life. And during that time, I, I knew I wasn't being my authentic self. I didn't like doing the news. I, I just didn't like it. But the voice of my father, who thought he knew what I was supposed to do, and even my own voice saying, wow, this is an important job. My father was saying, don't you give up that job, girl. You're making $25,000. You're never going to make that in one year. So eventually, my bosses let their feelings be known. They took me off the news and put me on this local talk show called People Are Talking. And when that decision was made at first, I thought it was a demotion. But after one day on that talk show, I felt so energized and so fueled, I knew that I had come home to myself. 
And that's what living integrity, even in your work, feels like. So trust me when I say that only you know what that feels like for you. And with that in mind, I want us to be more in alignment with the truth for ourselves this week. Think about everything we've covered in the past several weeks. Who you're meant to be, who you are right now. What have you been waiting and wanting to do? All those insights should fuel your decisions about how you move through the world right now. Pay attention to what makes you feel lit up from the inside. Examine any moments when your, 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 your head's saying one thing and your spirit is saying another. Now would be the perfect time to ask, what are you waiting for? What's the dream that you've been putting off pursuing until you have more money or you have more courage or you have more time? That last reason, more time, always kind of baffles me, you know, because you can work, work your fingers to the bone, scrimp and save to build your nest egg. You can work the, the, the nerve to take a big leap, but you cannot work to add more time to the clock or guarantee more days in your life. A few years ago, uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing television powerhouse Shonda Rhimes about what moment most changed her life. And here's what she shared. She said, possibly 9-11, but in a, a, a positive, strange way, because it was the thing that made me once again wake up and say, if the world's going to end tomorrow, there are things I need to do. And that's what drove me to sort of adopt my first daughter. That's what she said. So this coming Saturday, we all know, marks the 20th anniversary of this tragic day in our lives when the lives of nearly 3,000 people were taken in New York City, the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And to this day, I can tell you, I can be doing the most ordinary thing, like bending over to tie my shoe or hanging up my robe in the closet when I suddenly think the people who died that day did the exact same thing. They all did those ordinary things before leaving for work and expected to do it again the next day, but they never got the chance. So all death teaches us, I believe, about life. This week, as we reflect on the lives and the dreams lost on 9-11, I encourage you to also think about how that tragedy, how those deaths can move us to live differently. Whatever you've been putting off today, I'm here to tell you is the day to start, even if that means taking the smallest, teensy-einsy step forward, because really, what are you waiting for? Have a great week, everybody. And remember, even if it's teensy einsiest, I don't even know if that's a word. If it's a teensy, teensy, tiny step, take that step now. Don't wait. When I first started as a broadcaster, I was 19, very insecure, thrown into television, pretending to be Barbara Walters, looking nothing like her, and still going to college. So I do all my classes in the morning from eight to one, and then the afternoon I work from two to 10 and did the six o'clock news. And would stay up and study and all that stuff, at, you know, until one, two, or three o'clock in the morning, and then just start the routine all over again. And my classmates were so jealous of me that I remember like taking my little $115 paycheck, and um, at the time I thought it was really a lot, but taking $115 and trying to appease them. I would like, always, anytime anybody needed money, I was always offering, oh, you need $10? Or taking them out for pizza, ordering pizza for the class and things like that. Trying to, that whole disease to please, that's where it was the worst for me, I think, because I wanted to be accepted by them and could not be. Because first of all, I didn't have the time. They wanted, wanted me to pledge and I didn't have the time to pledge. I, was, I didn't have the time to be a part of all the other college activities or a part of that whole lifestyle. And it was very difficult for me socially. Really one of the worst times of my life because I was trying to fit in in school and be a part of that culture, but also trying to build a career in television. It's very difficult for me to even see myself as successful because I still see myself as in the process of becoming successful. To me, successful is getting to the point where you are absolutely comfortable with yourself and it does not matter how many things you have acquired. Uh, the ability to learn to say no and not to feel guilty about it, to me, is about the greatest success I have achieved. Uh, the fact that I have, you know, in the public side, done whatever is fine. It's all a part of a process for, for growing for me. 
But to me, to have the, in, the kind of internal strength and internal courage it takes to say, no, I will not let you treat me this way, is what success is all about. It's the same thing that prevents you from being abused as a child, that prevents you from being abused as an adult, that allows you to build success for yourself. I will not be treated this way. I demand only the best for myself. You are worthy to say no. You are worth that it's okay if you say no. It's okay if you say no and then people don't like you. That's really okay. The important thing is how you feel about what you're doing, how you feel about yourself. It's a long struggle though. It's a long struggle. And I'm just hoping that, you know, in the work that I do on the show and the speaking that I do around the country and that young people who are watching this can get the lesson sooner than I did. Because it's painful, because you keep repeating it over and over and over.